So, that's what we let off, let off, right? Yeah, okay, so. And, so, so, um, so last time I introduced the index of a, a, chunk, a chain complex. So you can think of this as, so all of this, the, the reason that um, chi, the Euler number, uh, has this plus minus strange thing is inherently because there's an underlying homological algebra. And the dual of which is the cohomological algebra. And there's a natural pairing as you integrate between elements of these two. So just to fully convince you of this fact, um, uh, you can sort of see this, the, the origin, the true origin of the minus sign here. So if you look at, so what is, what is, what is chi? It's the alternating sum of the Betty numbers, or the alternating sum of the dimensions of the vector spaces that fit into this complex. The claim is that this object should also be the alternating sum of appropriate number of of uh, simplicities in, in each dimension. I'm using simplicities, you don't have to. The, 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 the universality theorem of, of homology of homology says that you can replace this by anything. Just as long as you're in the right dimension and you count plus minus the dimension of this alternating object, you should always get the same thing. So <clears throat> remember, so let, let's pretend we're using simplicities, so triangulations of the manifold. And then you have a coban, you have a boundary operator that takes an R dimensional object and an R minus one dimensional object. I mean literally like boundary of boundary. And the property of R is that dr dr minus one is zero. That's the, the point of this homology algebra. So the d squared is equal to zero. The cohomological statement to this is not squiggly d, but ordinary d also squares to zero. So one goes this one, the other goes the other one. So, fine, because this is a linear operator, so this is kind of pretty that you can you see this happening. Why is this, why are these two equal? It's because of this fun object, fun fact that we recall from first year, first year linear algebra. Because this is linear, I haven't proven to you for this linear, but you can, you can, you can see this, I mean, it's, it's fine, it's a boundary operator, right? You can add, you can formally add objects here, it's gonna be linear. Uh, we recall <coughs> that any linear operator has the property that the dimension of the, the pre-image is the sum of the dimension of the kernel of this map plus the dimension of the image. All right, so th this is the statement that every matrix is, um, you know, rank plus null space. Right, this is null space, that's rank. So any linear operator will have this property. This has nothing to do with any of the other stuff. This is just because this is linear. On the other hand, because we've defined homology to be the dimension of you know, whatever object is in the homological algebra, so it's dim of curve n, because h is curve n, right? Uh, with shift. So that's, so the, um, what I'm trying to say is that over the years I've realized where that minus sign comes from, it comes from this shift. Right, because well, this is by definition, whoa, this is by definition, this thing is curve of this over the M of the next one. So dim of this is dim of this, which is the dim of this one minus the dim of this one. So now you can just, you can just substitute. So this sum, alternating sum, becomes, because of this fact, um, you can just substitute in. It's the plus of this and plus the m of this, because this and this is is the dim of each one of these uh, vector spaces. Right. So now you see the origin of the minus sign is because if you relabel this r to r minus one, you shift out a minus, and that minus is the alternating sum for the beta numbers. So it's kind of cute. So this is why. Uh, of course, I mean, what I say is nonsense, because you are, in some sense, you're making homological algebra work 
to make this work. But I'd, I'd rather think of it the other way, because it's sounds cuter. You would just say, well, this is a natural consequence of the properties of vector spaces, that you would do something crazy, like doing alternate and stuff. So, bottom line, this is why everything I've said here works about at least this bit. You know, well, how do we get the number two? Right, because we were counting, how do we get the two, right? Because we did four minus six plus four. So this minus ultimately comes from, and this two is the Euler number for anything that's homologous to a convex polytope. So that's kind of that's kind of nice. So this that, that's why we do this minus one. I just learned something really cool over the weekend. Like evolutionary biologists also use the word homologous. I didn't know. Like when you say a species is homologous to another species, it means they have a common ancestor. I'm just I'm saying this because I think it, this is waiting for a paper to be written. Like the homology of homology. Like, can we compute like homology of species? Uh, yeah, but it's just just not supposed to be. So, <coughs> so this is our fault. So we're happy with this. Uh, so uh, so uh, it, look, it, it took me so long to do this. In fact, I lost it. Um, so that that all works. Now we can say everything in a much more sophisticated language, because remember I told you that. The, the inside of Gauss, Bonnet, is that this chi, which is a um, com combinatorial object coming from here, should be the integral over some curvature over the, over the surface. Right. And of course now, because I keep on emphasizing the pairing between homology and cohomology, we can rewrite this integral in a much, much sexier way. So this is what we usually call intersection product. Of course, you know, the, this is a period integral because you're integrating a, you know, a Ricci form, a form over a surface, right? you know, a two form over a two dimensional manifold. But the way you really should think about this is in terms of this, in, this intersection pairing, which you write the class of the surface should be dotted with the class of this object, and that class we call the first chart class. So gauss bonnet suddenly becomes this fact, that this homological class dotted with this cohomological class is equal to chi. And the four pi is even built in into the class of R. So why is this important? Because this is almost categorically the fact that these are this this into this dot product is a topological invariant because you're, you're just thinking of class intersection. So in, in algebraic geometry, this is sort of the beginning of what's called intersection theory. And you can read all about it in Fulton's great book called Intersection Theory, but we don't need most of it. This is just so this integral should be thought of as, as this. In other words, this thing, which you can all do it completely algebraically in terms of algebraic geometry implies gas bonnet. So what's really interesting is that if you go to Chern's grave, this is why I love spending so much spending time in Nanke, because Chern is actually buried at Nanke in front of the Chern Institute. Like his tomb, the entrance of the Chern Institute of Mathematics is the tomb of Chern. Like it's very humbling, you just came, whoa. And the tombstone of Chern is this. Uh, I mean, so it's his handwritten notes, and with you know it's like some derivation, and then this. Of course, he didn't call it C1 because you know people call it C1 after term, but he wrote some some version of this, and then he says this in particular implies Gauss Bonnet, which is what which Chern I guess Chern considers one of his greatest achievements. I should I should correct that. It's actually not entirely true that Chern is buried in front of the Chern Institute. One third of Chern is buried in front of the Chern Institute. So he and his wife had their ashes mixed and divided into three parts. So into the three parts that are closest to his life. So he's the place of his birth, the place where he did his scientific career, which is Berkeley, 
and the place of his death. So it's kind of one third. If you think about why one third is still one third in front of the transcendence term in the, um, but anyhow. <coughs> but it's really quite interesting. There's that really, so it's really, it's really bad that, you know, because of COVID, we could, every, every two years, I, 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 I organize this workshop in the Chern Institute. And of course, you're all welcome, but this year it became online. But you should just go see that. It's huge, it's black marble, it's amazing. And, and it's this line, basically, a version of this line, inclined gas line. Okay, that's fine. So how do you write Riemann Roch in this really nice way? Riemann Roch then says that this intersection pairing is exactly equal to the degree of the anti-canonical bundle. So that's sort of the, well, okay, I, I haven't really defined for you what the anti-canonical bundle is, but, okay, I'm gonna define it for you just in one line. It's the top wedge form. It's, it's the top wedge form of the, um, uh, of your cotangent bundle. So for any manifold, there's a tangent bundle. Its dual is the cotangent bundle. So the tangent bundle is the space, the, 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 the basis of the tangent bundle is the differentials locally, the d by the axis. The cotangent bundle is the d axis, the forms, uh, in this you know, natural pairing. And uh, that's, um, you know, that's a dimension n object. And you take the n antisymmetric product of that. That makes it the dimension one object, and that's the anti-canonical bundle. So the this is the core fact of Riemann Roch is that this integral is equal to um, the Euler number as stated in this particular way that is actually equal to the degree of that bundle. I will show I'll show you more examples of this in a minute. Um, and then finally, in terms of number theory. The zeta function of any surface of, of genus G then becomes of this form. You always get B0 equal to 1, B2 equal to 1, because it's connected. All the surfaces I talk about are, 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 are connected uh, surfaces. So we have a, the class of the point and the class of the whole thing. So, <clears throat> and you got this degree 2G polynomial on top. So that's the local zeta function, which is kind of yeah. This degree. Oh yeah, I haven't really quite. Yeah, that's a, that's. A, uh, I'm trying to avoid it, so I don't have to go into this whole digression and the bubbles. And it, it it's the it's the it's the degree of the transition function of the line bundle. So for, for P2, we saw this already. In P2, because your transition function is, like your transition function is one over Z, so your form, your top top one form is ZZ, and that transition is, is, is the order of this pole. Mm -hmm. so, so I would write, actually, I would actually write that the canonical bundle over CP1 is O of two, that's what that O notation means, it's a degree two object, and that two is this two. For the, for, um, for, for uh, torus, because it's rigid flat, um, the, the holomorphic form is just dz, and, and the degree of the canonical bundle is zero, there's no transition, it's just a one, right? there's, it's a trivial transition function. And I would write, the degree of, the, of the, the canonical bundle of the T2 is O, O0, which is O. And in fact, that is my, going to be my definition of clavial. A clavial manifold, for our purposes, would be a manifold, a complex manifold, or to complex Kähler manifold, I'm going to be about Kähler in a minute, a complex Kähler manifold whose degree of its uh, canonical bundle, or the top wedge form of its cotangent bundle, is O. And that would be my working definition of a caveat. And this is indeed true for the for the for the liquid surface. So if you really want to go back to, to the to the to Riemann Roch, you really should write h upper zero minus h lower zero is equal to chi. Where h lower zero, sorry, h yeah, h h upper zero counts the number of global sections, and h1 counts the dual of that. 
but that'll get me too far to talk about homology, and I don't want to brush that under the rug. Maybe a little someday. Yeah, but the I think the cleanest way to, to say this is um, is this. I'll just kind of write. So the cleanest way to try to say all of this is this. Um, <coughs> so um, so whatever, whatever manifold there it is, um, say complex manifold. I'm going to put the Kelly condition here. There's some manifolds of so, so complex uh, of uh, uh, some complex dimension. Uh, say of, of, of real dimension n. So I'm trying to is n, right? So <coughs> I can the 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 dimension of the cotangent bundle of this, right? So this is so the cotangent bundle is the span of all possible one forms. So it's dx one locally up to dx n. Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. That's fine. So that's what the cotangent bundle is. It's the it's the span of the the d's. So you can always take the highest wedge product of this. So that's the totally anti-symmetric form constructed of this. And this is what this is dimension one because it, well, it's just essentially d one wedge of the wedge. And the degree. So when this thing is just O of zero, that this transition function is trivial in some sense, then I would call such manifold a cardinal. With the extra Kelly condition, which I will need to find in a minute. This is not cardinal. This complex is not cardinal. I need, so it, usually you just write this. So P2, P1 doesn't have this property. So I would write the canonical bundle of P, P1, of CP1, I would write the canonical bundle of CP1 is O P1 of degree 2. That's the 2 in the, in the transition function. Sorry, what's this O? Yeah, exactly. So this O is the notation, which says it's the line bundle of um, transition function of order or whatever. Okay. Yeah, so this is the, the O. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm explaining this very terribly, because I don't, want, I don't need this fact. I don't want to go deep into it. So, um, so line bundles. Over any manifold, of any complex manifold, is always written as O of M okay. of degree k, where this degree, this k, this integer k, tracks the order of the pole of your transition mm -hmm. function. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, for for P one, I would write O of two, which is the, that that says that the order two pole. For T two, which is our theory case, is just O. And that's going to be my working condition for Kleinberg. It's very, very special. Right? Most manifolds don't have this property. Right? Why would it be? And it's because T2 is cardinal. I can write O of 0, which is just usually written as O. I don't think I'll ever use this O. Oh, no, I will use it one more time. And then I will never use it again. So the cardinal thing is just that the, you have this trivial transition. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And this, of course, the Kleinberg one fold. And then it goes crazy. You would think, like, you know, maybe there aren't that many for for two poles and three poles. Um, a, a complex dimension one. There's only this is the only one. Complex dimension two. At least there's T four. Like that's actually true. Um, and then complex dimension three goes crazy, and it goes crazy henceforth. And I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. Yeah, Yes, for Keller it, it, it is. It's actually equivalent, and that's 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 Yao. That's what Yao. That's what uh, what Yao got the Phillips medal for. Is to show that this is equivalent. It's actually highly non-trivial. I, I I don't pretend that I know the entire proof. You just ask him. But you, you can imagine why the proof may be hard, because Ritchie flat is a purely analytic statement, right? This is a purely algebraic statement. So you, you need a, to translate one to the other and show it's a nonlinear, which is highly not trivial. You don't get those medals for nothing. So, 
So yeah, I just want to emphasize everybody should be familiar with this older picture. And this has nothing to do with uh, with uh, uh, the canonical bundle. Just have any line bundle over a manifold, over a complex manifold, you can always write this older picture to denote the degree of its transition function. <coughs> so we're we're really nice. I mean, look at look at the equivalence of equalities, right? So chi is topology. This integral is differential geometry. And of course, you can write it in a sexier way into intersection form, this period integral. And that's intersection theory in algebra geometry. This is also equal to the degree of the canonical bundle. And that's an algebra geometry statement. It is also equal to the plus minus degrees of the zeros and poles of the local zeta function, which comes from number theory. And the fact that this is plus minus comes from homological algebra which is invective. So the sequence of, in, I mean, this is 200 years, really, of, of mathematics, to just even recognize that these five different branches of mathematics are related. And that's why it's so important. And this is just dimension one, right? This is the complex dimension one, just for surfaces. So we'll, the, the, the whole point is, can we generalize this to arbitrary dimension? And the, the long story short, Almost, but for Kähler, you can. And that's why we need the Kähler transition. And now we're really entering, we inter we're entering the deep waters of algebra geometry. So this is, you can't, this is just too good to be true in general. There are bits and pieces, you know, this one, uh, maybe, I don't know, um, maybe at least for Claudia, or at least for Kähler, some of these will be, will be true. So then we need to add one more transition. So, but before I get to Kähler, this is hard. So I want to emphasize this. You know, remember we got this by this alternating plus minus sum because of dim curve tricks, right? And this is kind of cute because, because of this in the algebra. In, in other words, I mean, if I give you a matrix, right, that's essentially what, what this says. Uh, if I give you a, a, a matrix, the only thing I really can say is the sum of its null space and the demand and, and its rank, right? That's what this statement is. I, the only thing I know is that the, the sum of the two is equal to the dimension of the pre-image of this matrix. But it's really, really, really hard to compute individual pieces. I mean, how do you find the rank of matrix? The only way I can do it is Gaussian elimination. And that's an expensive step. There's no cheap way out of it. And what's nice about all this package is this alternating sum, because of gauss bonnet or because of the intersection theorem, can be replaced by an integral, and then that becomes easy. The individual pieces remain still very difficult to compute. So that's why when I say, you know, if I give you a homological object, or whatever it is, or cohomological object, to find the dimension of each piece, you know, H, if I say H5, that's really, really hard. There's no, tri there's no tricks about it. The power of the index theorem is that I may not know the individual pieces, but I can do this alternating sum, and that can be done by simply doing this integral. And that's the content of the index theorem, of which Riemann Roth is just a tiny case, and all, all that stuff, Gas Bonnet, all that stuff are just special cases. And, and in particular, this integral becomes in general for any for any smooth manifold, it doesn't have to be complex, to be the ch the churn class of your of the, e even any any bundle over it. It's this particular wedge product of the churn character and the top and the top character. And that's why these things are important. I'm not, I'm not defining what they are, but you saw this happening here, right? That this R, the class of R over four pi is the is C1, the first churn class. You can imagine in general, for arbitrary manifolds, this is still true. There is still an expansion, a polynomial in these things. You can, but that's why the chart class and the top class is important. Because this combination still allows you to do an integral. And that integral always gives an, an integer. Why? Because you are really doing this intersection, this dot product. And that integer is at least equal to the alternating sum of the individual pieces of, of some kind of homological object. But each one is very, very hard. And it's really, really hard. There's no technique to do it. 
I mean, well, there is technique, what I'm saying, there's no, uh, sorry, there's no cheap way out of it. You just have to bite the bullet and compute from your needle. It's, it's, it's okay, in fact, it's a sequence of vector spaces, and if you really want to do the programming of computers and how to stage do it, it's computing that matrix, but D is a matrix, so in some basis, all the D's are matrices, find that matrix, find the curl of that matrix, and then quotient out all the possible images of the previous matrix that comes in. It's a linear algebra problem, but it's very expensive. Right. The only thing is that, um, so th this generalization is due to a TNS index, so that's why we call this a uh, index term, and that's why the index term is so powerful. It's the big massive generalization of Galois. So this makes you laugh and this makes you cry. So happy? This is a playful introduction, so I don't want to go into all the details. This, this will just make you cry. It may make me cry. But it, believe it or not, this computation shows up in physics. And so far I have said nothing about physics, which I will do this lecture. I will finally say something like, why does this even show up in physics? Like, what's this going to do with physics? <clears throat> but before I do that, um, we can see there's this really nice three-way division. Genus zero is Ricci positive. In fact, genus zero is the sphere, and the sphere is constant, constant positive curvature. So in the in the in the GR community, this is the sitter. Genus bigger than one, it's called hyperbolic. And these are all of the Ricci negative things. So if you put out any metric on these things, it, you're guaranteed to have negative curvature. Um, and then right at the intersection is this very special case, which is Ricci flat. And that's Clavier. So even if you go, I mean, of course, Clavier is much later, so even if you, before you get to anything could to do with Clavierness, there's something very special about this quantum case, which is this Ricci flat case. So zero curvature, positive curvature, and negative curvature. So this is this is Riemann. So this is called Riemann uniformization. Right, so it, you can you can put metrics on because remember you know you, so what is Riemann uniformization is that it's a statement that these things can be done by quotients of the complex plane. Remember they're complex objects. So this is just complex plane quotient by lattice. This is this is complex upper half plane even by some very special group and you can fold it up in the same thread. So uniformization says that you have this case, this case, and this case. So finally I introduced Kaler, but I'm gonna introduce you in one last. What, what the hell is this Kaler condition? Well, <coughs> I'm just gonna define it in, in, in one, one line. If in the very special case, your metric comes to a potential, then it's Kaler. That's it. That's all I'm going to say about Kaler. Why do I need this condition? It's because with this condition, you can generalize everything I've said so far. Because of the caveat there. Before, if you don't have Kaler, this is much, much worse. It just gets crazy. Um, so obviously, if I put this condition, it, it's, it's pretty nice. So, all Riemann surfaces, everything I've said so far is automatically Kaler. So then it's equivalent condition to Kaler is the existence of a closed one one form. Uh, but of course, we're on the surface, it's a two form. So D with a two form is so always zero by guarantee. So all Riemann surfaces are automatically Kaler. So that's why, you know, Gauss and Riemann didn't have to think about this extra condition. But then when you want to generalize the higher dimension, you really want to put this condition just to make it. So what are other, so what you may think, of, well, you know, this is a pretty crazy condition. Um, it must be very special, but it's not, because you can show that CPN is actually Kaler. So how do you show that CPN is Kaler? Uh, because remember, on the, the, there's the Studi, the Studi Fubini metric on CPN. You can put this canonical one. And that one comes actually from the double derivative of Fubini Studi potential. You can explicitly construct that. So anything that CPN, and so CPN is Kaler, and in fact, any holomorphic polynomial intersection, any system of holomorphic polynomials in CPN, otherwise known as an algebraic variety, are also Kaler. 
So basically, everything in algebraic geometry is Taylor as far as we're concerned. You can, of course, there are many examples of non Taylor complex manifolds, but we don't even think about it because everything we do here will be embedded into some version of CPN or product of CPN, so we're fine. So, for our purposes, now life becomes simple, right? We only consider Riemann surfaces, complexifiable surfaces, and we only consider sub varieties of CN, which are algebraic varieties which are automatically Taylor. So, our lives are nice. We don't have to think about anything. That doesn't have this. So all projective varieties are. So by projective varieties, you know, everything that goes to CPN. So basically, I'll do it over here. So let me restate this Riemann uniformization. Here's real. I mean, I, I don't have, I'm not saying anything about complex here, right? In terms of Keller geometry. So here's a statement of surfaces as real objects. Let me repeat this trichotomy. As surfaces in as Keller objects, as Keller Keller curves, and you know complex algebraic curves. Now we just give different names, right? So here this thing is called Ricci flat. Now we call this thing caveat. Everything that is positive curvature, this is arbitrary dimension. This is why we did this Keller thing. So anything that is a complex Keller manifold with positive curvature, locally positive curvature, this is called a funnel variety. So you remember we're now in the, in the, comp in the complex algebraic world. So this is called funnel. This is called caveat. And everything above is called general type. So why do, we, why do we have these strange names? It's because it's a theorem that in every complex dimension, a Kähler manifold, which is funnel, there's only a finite number of topological possibilities. It's just nice. And we already saw this in complex dimension one. There's just g equal to zero. That's it. The, the sphere. That's the only CP1. It's the only Kähler manifold of complex dimension one. Uh, sorry, only Kähler manifold of complex dimension one, which is finite. Um, the boundary case is what we call caveat. This is Kähler and Ricci flat. So that's one important definition of caveat. And it's a still an open conjecture of Yao that there's a finite number of possible topological types. And it's conjecture in every dimension. We already see this. In complex dimension one, there's only one. It's the T2. That's why T2, the elliptic curve is so special. That's the only caveat in complex dimension one. In complex dimension two, so now if you're thinking about four manifolds, there are actually only two of them. There's the four torus, the T4, which is one of these, which is the only type of one. You can think of the generalization. And there is this crazy thing called K3. That's why K3 is so important. This is K3 surface. And that's, it's the only Clavial. Again, it's, it's, it's fine. It, it's consistent with Yao's conjecture. Final varieties of complex dimension two, uh, you can start listing them out. They're the, um, the Del Peso surfaces. That's why, you know, we like them so much. So there's CP1, cross CP1, that's one of them. There's CP2, that's another one, which is also Fano. And there are nine other exceptional cases. So it's again consistent with this theorem. There's a finite number of topological types that we use. Um, this one is K3. So K3 is kind of cute. It's, named, it's called K3 because it's named after Kumar, Kadaira, and Kaler. So K3. And it's a joke because apparently there's a mountain called K2. I think Forrest will know about it. I think K2 is like one of the big mountains in near the Himalayas or something. And it's really hard to find. It's further south. But is that what it is? It's called K2, right? Yeah. I, 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 can't, I, I think it's called K2 because it's I like like two mountaineers called Mr. K and Mr. K. And or maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's named after Greek. Anyhow, whatever. But the K3 surface was is the is the so it's kind of nice, right? So um so, so complex, I should write this, in, in, in complex dimension one, everything, I should write the table. I love tables. Complex dimension one, the only final one is, is CP1. The only clavial one is T2. And everything else, all the genus greater than, the genus greater than one type. So that's general type. You know, whenever mathematicians say general type, it means they've given up. 
It's like whatever. It's like it's just not even classifiable. I think it probably is actually unclassifiable. It's not just unclassifiable. I think it's unclassifiable. Like classifying general type varieties is a Turing incomplete problem. So it's just like forget it. It's not even worried about. So in complex dimension two, <coughs> the only one here is T4, um, a smooth compact. And the other crazy thing, which is K3. And the only final ones are CP1 cross CP1, the direct product, and CP2. Right, you can just check the dimensions for K, plus eight others. And they call delta two statistics, and they call various kinds. And there's lots of deep, exceptional, beautiful stuff that makes Pierre cry. Uh, of joy. Of joy, of pure joy. I mean, it's actually. I, we can, I can give a whole lecture on just this, why is there 10 of these? And it has something to do with the exceptional Lie algebras. It's actually kind of crazy. You know, the, the, the Del Pezzo surfaces, I mean, one-to-one -one correspondence with E6, E7, E8, and all that entire chain of sequences. I think, you know, and like, Kirsty, Kirst, Kirst, you are, you are, you are, you are a daughter of Hanani, right? He goes <laughs> on and on and on. I'm son of Hanani, we're, we're, we're siblings. And Ami like cries about Del Pezzo, like his entire life, or half of his life is about Del Pezzo, I think, right? Or has he not imposed that on you yet? He's, he's talked to me about it several times before, but I didn't have a clue what they were at the time. Now you know. Now you know. So it, they're very special because they're, they're this, this, they fill out this box, and the only one to fill out, which is kind of strange. If you think about like what, what are Del Pezzo surfaces, they are the two complex dimensional analogs of the sphere. That's why they're so important. That they, they're the only ones. As far as Kenner geometry is concerned, they're the only ones. So, I mean, obviously, CP2 is one of them, the cross, uh, CP1 cross CP1 is one of them. And then there are these exceptional ones, which makes Pierre cry out of joy. There are two of these, and then the general type here is like whatever. whatever. I mean, you can list those, you can find them. Like, like Harshon actually has a plot of these. Like Hartron, why would they ever plot anything? It must be like that's like the only diagram in all of Hartron is to plot some properties of these things. Like he actually has like like a scatter plot. It's totally crazy. What is Hartron? Jeez. Anyhow, and then dimension three, complex dimension three. Um, question mark? Question mark? But they're finite. There's a whole list of these suckers. And I don't know whether it's been fully classified, but at least at least, at least the toric ones have been classified. There's kind of 112 of these suckers. I think there are more if you're not toric. And he loves toric stuff, right? So the toric ones are classified. We should play some play with these. And this one, the clavial ones, so far you would imagine, well, you know, there's type one of these, type two of these, maybe there's three of these. But so far we have found over two billion of these, two different distinct topological types. Just, just by data gathering. It's kind of crazy. And then this, forget about it. This is like, you know, it's, there's so much. This is, we know there's an infinite number of these. But the, the, the theorem says that whatever you fill in in these boxes, this is definitely finite in topological, in, you know, finite number of topologies. And the conjecture says that whatever you fill in in the middle column should also be finite in number of topologies. Except that we have no idea what this is. It could, could, could be in the trillions, but it's a, it's a finite number. We've already found two billion. So physicists found two billion. Mathematicians will never do this, though. This is sick. Like, you know, we, like physicists over like 20 years have just like listed one by one. And I'll show you this, if, how to do this. Like, it was one, to another one. And then by 20, by 2000, they, it went up to 500 million. And about 10 years ago, it went up to around about two billion. So that you see what I'm getting at right now. This is data science is at, at its best. You know, it's, it's so much, it's so beautiful. And that's it. And we take a break and I can like tell you why this stuff should so the, so this is like this is the intro to the to the lectures of what I actually want to tell you about. So this so just I wanted to give you an idea of like how this came about. Historically, why were mathematicians thinking about this problem? And you can see, you know, it goes back to 1736, where it all started, because Euler solved the Königsberg problem. And it, came, it kind of like went, went, on, went on this long digression of like 200 years.
150 years of geometry. So, and, and just because it's, it's such a nice structure. And somehow in 1984, this stuff, which is almost completely unknown to physicists, suddenly came into the physics world. But the only thing that would have come into the physics world before any of this would be the real version of this, where, I mean, I guess some version of this. Um, oh, 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 sorry. Of, um, This. This, 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 this shows us, this shows up in GR. But all of the other stuff, not really. Until suddenly, by pure accident, you went into the physics literature. Is it break time? It's break time. Did I get very about it? Why? We've got another slide that says break time. Yeah, no, I'm going to set slide. We're going to your next set of slides. <coughs> but this is a really interesting... I think this table is not really emphasized. Because a lot of modern geometry is just trying to fill in this table. That's right. How much... You know, where, where, you know here's a manifold. Where do, you, where do you slot it? Too much. I'm not going to go through 147 <laughs> slides. Um, yeah, this well, the funny thing, I, I went to an experimentalist talk. This guy's totally crazy. I went to a lesson departmental close him like some years ago. And like, <laughs> by the end of the hour, he was on slide number um, 20 out of 470 or something crazy like this. And he says, oh, well, I think I still got 420 slides left. And most of them are pictures, to be fair, but still. And so he said, uh, I guess I have to go really fast. So he just held the space button. <laughs> <laughs> and he's having seizures. <laughs> and then he says, you see this, you see this, right? And I say, yeah, sure. So I'm not going to go through 157 slides. I'm just going to go back. <clears throat> First thing, buy this book. It's the best book ever. I mean, so what I tried to do was to write some of what I've been talking about into this. Um, so. Oh, it's your own. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to advertise it. It's fantastic. Well, actually, don't buy it. Get the department to buy it. And there's actually, I don't think Imperial has a copy of this. Get Ami to use his grant to buy it. Like, you know, just like at every university, you just buy it. But I think what I'm going to do is going to write more of this into a book. Like what I've been saying, this doesn't have any number theory in it, because this is about your club, yeah, but and more about machine learning. But I really want to write what I've been telling you guys into like a textbook, like for fun. It will be called Math Without Any Theorem and Definitions, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> So I talked about this, so, so now you're really familiar with this, and that's just prettier versions of what I've been saying. Uh, you know, nice so color pictures. So, okay, so now let's get to uh, this, uh, you know, the... So one why pair, um, just to summarize this table, so that the abstract version of this table is basically this. I'm not even going to read this conjecture. Because it's just, it, we don't need it. But the point is, this statement here is the general average of this. That's why the Fabi conjecture is so important. It's the, the fact that there exists some kind of a C1 that controls this sequence of equality. So that's the essential content of Fabi conjecture. And, <clears throat> and of course, Yao yeah, proved it. Yao yeah, the total legend. So he proves it. That's why he gets the field method immediately. Because you know it, it is the generalization of this diagram to arbitrary dimensions. So, so for our purposes then, um, the, again this definition that we're going to do is um, Kamer Ritchie flat. So everything again, everything I say here is smooth compact. So we won't go you leave the smooth, you leave the compact. It's much, much worse than this. Smooth and compact, always protect them. So, why does this stuff ever show up in physics? So, I think I think people in this crowd, except you, who is a, a 
uh, the image is a is a, a random matrix not a, a guy, right? So like this is this is just for you. Everybody else knows here. This is like on this one slide of white. Only and 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 you, right? Who is a computer scientist, a machine learning expert? Everyone else is like you can just go sleep in five minutes. <coughs> so how does all this stuff suddenly come into physics? And it came into physics in I think I think. Um, in 1984, actually, of all, of all years. Um, so just very briefly, what these guys are thinking of, this one slide, you want to solve, you want to, you want to uh, have string theory in 10 dimensions down to uh, four dimensions. And I'm only going to talk, uh, because I'm only do smooth compact, so I'm only going to consider the first scenario, where you have six extra dimensions curled up. So this is people are solving this condition of uh, you know maximally uh, maximally symmetric condition of in some n fourth you have this this metric here. You want to find a product metric basically such that this remains some um, Minkowski. So that's the basic why people were thinking about this in, in, in the eighties. So again, this is very boring. You know, I'm just I'm just copy and pasted this from like three different shorts. So you can just read it. It's, it's not too important. Um, you can write down this. So look, in this paper in '85 and '86, you write down the Lagrangian for um, the heterotic string. So why would I think of the heterotic string? So this is quite interesting. So heterotic string was discovered in '85. This is for the string theory. So you can go to sleep for a second. Why would I think about this? Because heterotic string naturally came in the A. Right, you show there are two possible heterotic strings, the A plus the A, then the two, and they came about because of the, the Nare lattice, the self-dual lattice, and it just came to this is only two root diagram, this pure bigger thing. Um, E8 for people there, for physicists was like, well, this is God's greatest gift, because it's kind of interesting. Because so, what did string theory give us for free in the mid '80s? You get two things that were unexpected. One, you get the graviton. You didn't have to. Right? And then, oh wow, it is actually a theory of quantum gravity. That's the first surprise. That's the first string revolution. The second string revolution is this one. E gave E8. Again, for free. It's not like I'm putting this by hand. E8 came naturally because it's one of the only self dual analysis in dimension, six, uh, dimension 16. E8 plus E8. And why is E8 interesting? Because E8 has SU3 SU plus SU2 plus E1. It's, it's one of the guts, the great, you know. So you got a graviton for free, and you get to gate root for free, for free. Like somehow this came out. So that's like, oh, this is nice. Maybe it is a theory of everything. I think this is, but you know, but after these two revolutions, people are thinking like maybe this is really a theory of everything. So I think that's why people are excited about this. So they wrote down the the um, the, the action for the heterodox. So some low, you know, some low effective uh, uh, Lagrangian, low low energy effective uh, Lagrangian writer. We thought it was about some stuff, and you want to preserve Susie. And you work this out, I never worked this out myself. Because I don't know, I think who, who does this? I think Chris Hall, maybe? I think you know actually Chris Hall. Chris Hall was so offended when I called this the Strominger system. I called this the Strominger Yao system. Uh, because that's what I was told, because I come from the, the, the school of Yao. And then, uh, but, but Chris says, dude, man, no. dude, it's, it should be called the Hall Strominger Yao system. And after that, it's called the Yao. So this this system of variation is called the Hall Strominger Yao system. Okay, just Chris is a friend. Go and friend Chris. And <clears throat> and the deep. I'm, I'm not going to go. This is too boring. The point is the condition of, of the, the variation for this for for Su Susie to hold is that this should be zero. And there are many many solutions to this. And the simplest solution is to take the two factor. There are many, many, many more solutions to this. So everything I've said so far, as far as string theory is concerned, is much more. You get this non, you know, half flat manifold, non kähler There's, there's fine. I still solve the system, the Hall Schrödinger Yao system. Chris, sorry about that. Um, the, but the, the simplest solution to this system is a metric which comes from the double derivative of a potential. And a metric which is complex, and a metric, metric which is pitch flat. So at the time, they didn't have the physicists didn't have a name for this, which is kind of cool. So these these guys, 
right? Now, here's a beautiful story, right? I'm going to bore you in a little bit, so. Uh, Strominger was next door to Yao at the IS uh, when they got this set of solutions. And at the time, the people had no idea what these are. What is a, what is a manifold which is complex, such that its g mu bar comes from a, sin from a double derivative, and that this uh, the Ricci curvature vanishes. Right, so what is that? And, 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 and the story goes to Yao says, ah, what is this? Yao says, I just got a dose code for this. <laughs> I mean, literally. It's kind of really interesting. If this wasn't forced, okay, so this is a third surprise. So, right? Graviton for free, um, E8 for free, as, and then this is the Kaler Ricci flat manifold for free. And this is all boring, don't care, whatever. Um, so I'm only actually going to use all of this very current definition of flat. Yeah, the only one, the, this is not what I'm going to use. This, all, this, this, this C1 condition, the vanishing C1 condition, right? That, because we know the intersection theory, a C1 intersected the class of the manifold is zero. This is so This is really the only thing I'm going to use out of the cloud yell. So interestingly, what is really, really interesting <coughs> is um, these guys actually came up, it's these guys who actually coined the word Flaviao. It, it didn't come from math literature because Yao started telling Schrominger about the Clavi conjecture, which no physicist has heard of since that time, and, and why it's important in this historical context, I can tell you that. And, and Yao said, well, these are very special manifolds, they're richly flat-headed manifolds. And then Schrominger was like, you know, that's a really mouthful. Can we just call it Flaviao? I'm, I'm not sure these are exact words of the interchange, but that's, that's what actually, more or less what happens. So it, actually, it's physicists who actually coined the term Calabia because of this, this condition. And the, the, the importance is what I've been trying to say for the last two lectures. It's because of this generalization of the form that Gauss came up with. So this is all boring here. So the only, let's, let's just focus on a few key topological properties of Calabia. Right? First of all, because they're complex manifolds, we have a complexified version of the of the Betty numbers. So you can think about holomorphic and hybrid homomorphic essentially. So everything I've said so far, so all of the it's kind of funky now because all of the homology and cohomology, the DNA, now each gets complexified into two directions because of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. Right, so these things are called hot numbers. So the complexification of a Betty number is a hot number. So instead of Durand cohomology, now you have double cohomology. And simple nice facts, well, you know, these things have complex conjugation. So this is true. This is just, you know, you, you take the z to z bar. And you also have Poincare duality individually to um, the holomorphic piece and anti holomorphic piece. So this is the Hodge star action. So you can write down, instead of a single one, remember for, for, for manifolds, for n manifolds, we have b0, b1, b2, the, the Betty numbers. It, it becomes, for, for everything here, it becomes something like this one because it becomes a grid. But this grid, you write it 90 degrees up, and it looks like an argument, and that's for the whole time. Other fun things, um, it's, if, it, if it's compact, it's connected, and then this is one, this is one. So, we, so okay, obviously, this grid is top-down symmetric and um, left-right symmetric because of these two conjugation and Poincaré. Um, <coughs> for compact connected ones, this is one, this is one. Remember, like everything I've said so far, right? You know, for like CP1, it's one, zero, one. T2 is one, two, one, right? So the top and bottom is a one. This is the unfolding of that into complex. All right, so for CP1 now, it's 1, 1, 0, 0. For torus, it's 1, 1, 1, 1. So it's like, because you put an extra complex number in there. And so this is called Hodge diamond. And if it's simply connected, this is 1, oh, sorry, this is 0, and then and this is also 0. 
So, <coughs> finally, which is a, a condition that I haven't talked about, which I don't really need, this one, well, actually, I, I, can't, I can't say this. This is one, and then this is one, because remember, I said the, um, the O, the, 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 the anti canonical bundle is trivial. That means there's a unique holomorphic, the, the top form, there's a unique top form. So that this makes this one and not this one. That's the same, that's equivalent to saying that the um, um, the the that the the degree of the anti kind of hol holomorphic bundle is one. Uh, sorry, it's zero. And so there's a unique form. So this is one, this is one. So suddenly it becomes really, really simple. So for a smooth, compact clavier of threefold. The hush diamond reduces to this. And in particular, there are only two non trivial numbers the H11 and the H21. And so this is called the Kähler form, and then the source of the, 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 the Kähler structure, and the H21 is the complex structure. So if you think about so this is so the one one dimension, the one complex dimension one, the T two, it should be one 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 like this, right? So what are the one one? So that's that's the class of the point. This is the class of the entire elliptic curve. These two one one is sort of the analog of, of these two, and one is sort of the shape of the torus, and the other is the size of the torus. So this is a three dimensional analog of this. Well, we also know that because each one of the each each row is uh, remember uh, note, note that there's no minus one to the power right so this is just each row sum is the Betty number of each degree right? so that's one zero h one one two plus twice h two one h one one zero one that's the Betty numbers then you can do the alternating plus minus sum it gives you the Betty number equal to this. Which is just twice the difference of these two numbers. So the exchange of Kähler structure with complex structure. C complex structure is the shape, Kähler structure is the volume. And the Euler number is twice their difference, which is kind of a very nice topological property for co compact, smooth, connected, simply connected caveats. If, in fact, I've even added one more condition just to, to force this to be zero. I've added this if we even simply connected for threefold. I mean, of course, for, for one fold, then no, this is not simply connected because it's just the three dimensional version of this. So, finally, we can get to nice diagrams. Um, so, d equal to one is the surface of the donut, d equal to two is the four donut and this crazy K3 surface, and d equal to three, that's the nominal. Which is kind of when you know that's that's this column which one is that just a little column. I think um, I think Ellie and Pierre would just kind of be would be really interested actually try to try to just just write all of this. The, the final one I think the more interesting because it's very very finite. It's so finite. I was like one. So here's one, two, possibly five hundred million and possibly more. But the final one is like one, ten, maybe two hundred. You can actually lift them up and just like stare at it. Like totally cool. Get a very large piece of paper, like A minus two. Like A four is this, A three, I don't know, A ten. Uh, and just plug all of this two hundred and we'll just stare at it. It would be kind of interesting to do that. <coughs> um right, so let's try to realize all of this as projected onto the right. We already we we uh, we spent like the first two lectures trying to explain how to do this, right? This is the cubic in CP two, or the quartic in CP two. I remember that Riemann paste thing thing I've got all that, whose real slice should be the uh, so the the quadratic in CP two, the real slice of that are the conic sections, the cubic in CP two. The real slices of this would be the whatever the 34 different types of, of cubic curves that Newton classified as, as real, you know, things like, like this, and stuff like this. So we know how to construct these. And as a projected variety, this thing is 
degree three in CP2. You can generalize this argument by using again this, this statement that the anti canonical the, the, the canonical anti anti canonical bundle is zero, the trivial is O. You can use this and you can trust me there is this adjunction formula which I don't want to get into because this is supposed to be mathematics without theorems. So you can use a similar argument to say, bottom line, the degree of um, a degree n plus one polynomial in CPN is Pravia. This is the direct, so let's check that. So in so when n is two, two plus one is three, so the degree three polynomial in CP2 is Pravia, and that's exactly the elliptic curve. And this generalizes to all arbitrary dimensions. So this this follows immediately from uh, from a uh, schematic junction, which I don't want to get into. Um, but this is the first thing that Yao told Schrodinger. Right. Because this is very explicit. I mean, of course, Yao started going on about adjunction and, and canonical bundles, and Schrodinger's like, I've never heard this word before. I mean, literally, no physicist has had ever heard of these words before until that conversation. I want to be a fly in that room in 1985. In that room, what the hell were these guys talking about? How long did it take for these two guys, who are both obviously brilliant, one is a brilliant physicist and one is a brilliant mathematician, even to get to the level of the language when they can start to understand what they're talking about. And then I think Schrodinger must have pushed Yao over and over again. What do you mean, adjunction of the, of the degree of the canonical bundle? Blah, blah, blah. And Yao said, no, no, no. I said, blah, blah, blah. Until so, oh, you mean all I need to do is to create n plus one projective coordinates and take a homogeneous polynomial of that degree. Then I'm okay. That, was, that conversation must have come back and forth for at least a month, just to even get to the level. Get to level. So, I mean, so you can see this, right? So, I mean, it can be really, really, really totally explicit. So, in CP2, in CP2, the projected coordinates are x, y, and z. Right? Yeah, there's, only, oh, there's only one more projected coordinate than, than, than uh, because it's projected. So, this one would be a perfectly well defined Fabian manifold because it's a homogeneous cubic polynomial. And the vanishing locus of this is the elliptic curve, which is topologically T2. But the, this is true in general. So you need all this caringness. Right? You, need, you need this nice, all this nice property of caringness to get into. So for the CPN, <coughs> you could have x0 all the way up to xn, so n plus 1 polynomial for coordinates. Just write down the, you know, a generic polynomial of degree n in this, so like xn to the power of n plus x0 to the power of n. And you can other ones, like other, you know, all kinds of combinations, right? Here you can also have things like x squared y, you can also have xy squared, you know, etc. Right? As long as it's homogeneous. And the number of coefficients is roughly h1, h21. It's, it's roughly the comparison. It's not one to one. There are obstructions to it. But the number of coefficients in this count is roughly that. So this is nice. So suddenly, we can <coughs> start writing down Clavier triples. And one very easy one is called the so-called cyclic one. That's a very immediate way to create these. Because let's think about this as a, as a combinatorial problem, right? So you want CP uh, n in n plus 1 degree polynomial. So an immediate one is, well, how about 5 degree 5 in CP4? Right? That seems to work. Because this is Clavial, it's one degree higher than this. This is complex dimension four. This is one single constrained polynomial degree in dimension of, of, of a complex constraint. So the, the resulting algebra variety should be complex dimension three. So this is the famous quintet. 
It's just a homogeneity required for the system. So that's your first baby caveat we propose, which is the one that Yao calls for linear. Immediately it becomes a combinatorial problem. And then I think these guys immediately came up with five more. Right? So let's see, it's a, it's a purely combinatorial problem. <coughs> This is a degree five polynomial in CP4, so that's okay, that's good. But let's see this one. This is a degree two polynomial and a degree four polynomial intersecting each other, that's two constraints, but living inside CP5. So five minus two is three. That's good, that's a three dimensional complex manifold. And the degree is okay because two plus four is five plus one. So how many ways can there's only five ways to do it. If you want to project in, if you want to put in the single projective space, there's only five ways to do it. Right, let's take this one. You can also take a degree three polynomial and intersect another transverse intersection with another degree three polynomial like this. So the total degree six. Six is five plus one. And five minus two is three. So that's good. Purely complementary. So these are called complete intersections. You, you, it's sort of the best transverse uh, intersection. But then, well, you can go, you can go more. Um, you can take a degree three polynomial, intersect with a degree two polynomial, and intersect with another degree two polynomial. So the total degree is three plus two plus two, which is seven, which is six plus one. A six minus three is three. It's also good. So that's called. <coughs> and the, the last one. It's the tetraquadric, which means you take four degree two polynomials, because it's two times four is eight, eight is seven plus one, and seven minus four is three, so it's also good. So immediately you can write down five very special caveat triples. They're called um, cyclic caveats. That's kind of cute. I mean, just, I mean, it's really explicit. You just, you know, just write it down. And you can compute the Euler number for these suckers. And you know, there was the how it is, and it's a bit funky. And H11 for all of these is one, sort of by definition, because you've written this as, a, as polynomials in a single projective space. So your H11 is inherited from the H11 of the single projective space, which is one. Okay. <clears throat> and because two times the difference is chi, you can also get the other one. Um, what else can I say? And I won't bore you with this. C1 of all of these things are zero because they can't be out. C3 is just the same thing as Euler, Euler number. So the only other non trivial thing is C2. It's the second term part of this. So that's this number. You can compute this by, again, very difficult method. That's how you make a grown man cry. This is where you make a grown man laugh, because this is so good, you can just do this single integral. Right? To get chi, because chi is an index, you can always get that by, by because of the index. Right? This one, you really have to work on it. And then this one is sort of intersectional. So this is another, what this one does, it, com it counts how um, these things intersect themselves three times, so this is true intersect method. So by topological type of a Kähler manifold or Clavial, you mean this set of four, this set of numbers. So Yao's conjecture says the possible, you know, the possible vectors of these integers is a finite number in every dimension for all Clavial, and this is the open conjecture. For Fano, we know we can show that these possible combinations is finite. Could be big, but it's still an open conjecture that this four, this vector is uh, finite. <coughs> um, again, this one is the quintic. I can explain. This is the Fermat quintic for obvious reasons because it's sums of fifth power. Um, so that's cool. I mean, five. So, so we suddenly can write down five. So we can write one, the K 
cubic elliptic curve as a torus, and then we can write five of these in dimension three. Actually, imagine in dimension two, we can also write them. So in other words, in dimension two, it would be a degree four object in CP3. Right? That's because this is a three minus one is two. So yes, indeed, this is called the algebraic model for K3. So if you want to know what a K3 surface is, you just do the homogeneous degree four polynomial in these four percentage points. So that's the K3. So it's a nice family, right? You, you have the elliptic curve, the K3, and the quantity. And in fact, so as I promised, there's a lot of deep number theory in this, right? Because, you know, just imagine this, right? The, the, the single elliptic curve as a cubic in P2 gave you all that zeta function business, right? So naturally, people thought about, what if you generalize this to this case, to this case, what do you have, right? What, what does the Landon program say about this? So this is still work very much in progress. And, and so Candelas is now completely devoted to this problem. Having solved physics, it's now moved on to number theory. In, in some sense, you know, like I, I joke with Philip, he's like, well, you know, this paper theoretically solved physics, right? Because this showed that you can compactify with how the L manifold is zeta theory from the gravity. The details are in the works. <laughs> A lot of details, but whatever I care anymore. But having having finished physics, um, Philip is now really thinking about it. it's really deep. Like you know, because you know cubic 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 and CP2 to the the curve, the zeta function, the zeta function is this degree um, degree two polynomial and that if you do the Fourier the, the Dirichlet transform of that you get a weight two cusp modular form. So that's the level one of if you do it on K3 and, and higher, what do you get? Because at this boundary case, you have very interesting Lagrange statements. So Philip has found that for at least for the quintic, you um, do this Dirichlet form, find the zeta function, do the Zeta function, what kind of Q expansion do you get? I think, believe me wrong, I think you get a modular form of SP, which is kind of unexpected. So SL2 is the module, it's a modular form. Right? SL2 is at mid curve level. And if you go up higher, you should get different groups. So what are the generalizations of SL2? You get SP4, I think stuff like this. This one. And, and, and there definitely should be random matrix interpretations to this. And, and that's, I don't know, maybe it'll take another hundred years to settle all of this different connections in which way. I mean, there definitely should be. And you know, which a wood random matrix model one plot this should have you know zeros behavior to any of these uh, zeta functions. It's all I know. Completely, there's so much to work on. Uh, but this is we're only at the very, very beginning. You come at a good moment when we're getting excited by the Langlands program. We're just at the tip of this. Somehow Calabrianus is should be central to the Langlands program in general dimension. But it's, all, it's no longer just modular forms of SL2. Z, that should be SP, and then we should, they should also be related to, to you know, whatever random matrix model for these groups. I don't, I don't know. This is true. For you guys to work on. <coughs> so, let's get back to physics a little bit. So this is, again, so, so these guys chanced upon Clavialis by doing this, this Susie variation of the Hilary thing. The details ask how and Schrodinger. But they did something a little more than this. And this is where I want to go into for the next lecture. As I said, you know, the second surprise was E8. It gave natural gauge, you know, this was called gauge in so what is really interesting is if you take the SU3 tangent bundle of this family out, the commutant of E8 is E6. Back in 1986, people were still working on E6 gap theories. Nowadays, no self-respecting physicist would work on E6 gap theories. That was called SU0 gap. And that's just, just 
It's a nice model, but it's not definitely not a real data, which is fine. Um, but at least let's be play around with it. What's interesting is that for each syscap theory, all of the particle generations is calculating the consistent representation of E6. So that's that's the point of a gap theory, right? Because you know, if you think about you know what a quark is in SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, it's actually quite messy, right? So it's it's the three comma two comma minus one or minus a third and the discard. That's a pretty, you know. But if you put this into a simply uh, into a simple group like this, it's just a number. A quark lives in the 27 representation of this quark. That's why it's so interesting. And what these guys also realized was that the number of 27s is actually just, and the 27 bars, is just equal to the H21, H11, which is a very beautiful fact. And this is still true. In general, today we do better. No, no, no self respecting physicists where everything about E6 gut theories, but we think about SU5 or SO10 gut theories, the smaller groups. And there you can package it into like generalization for this, this group. But, it's not really important. but <clears throat> so these guys actually ask Yao a more specific problem than what a Kähler Ritchie flat manifold was. They ask him, in addition, because we know there are three particle generations of particles, or three generations of particles, like because CERN tells us so, they were asking this very beautiful topological question are there any Clavier three fold with all the characters, all the number of minus six? Because you know, two times three is six. And you can define one of them with the generation and give them So the point is that the absolute value of this should be three. The absolute value of this difference should be three, because CERN says there are three generations of Clavier. We don't know why. But, you know, I think Philip still hopes the other way. Could this be an explanation why there should be three generations of particles coming purely from geometry? We still don't, maybe, maybe. I don't know, it would be, It's a nice way of interpreting this, right? There are three generations of particles because string theory says you should look for index three of this. That certainly is true, but we don't have a selection rule of, of three. If you have a nice selection rule, selection rule for y index 3, then that would explain the particle. But so far we don't have that yet. Now we're getting to that, so that's part of the last thing. So. But okay, fine, so they're asking this. So, so Stranger was asking me in, in, in the first part, is that what the hell is a Kähler-Ritchie flat thing? In which case, you know, after three months of discussion, they finally realized they were talking about these things. And then the, the second question is, well, are there any in particular only number plus minus 6? So you know, immediately see that cyclic ones are rolled out. Right. This is pretty far from plus minus six. That's very unfortunate. But it's actually really interesting that it got it, 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 it became so unfortunate because this prompted them to do more. I mean, if, this, if one of these was like minus six or some multiple of minus six, they may have just honed in onto that particular manifold and then not thought about anything else and just try to beat that to that, right? Just keep on it, just think about this part. At some, some level, they did a little bit of this. But because none of this is plus minus six, it really made physicists start exploring more and more of these things, and, and which led to conjectures. Like you know, all of these conjectures came later after this collaboration. You know, the Yao's finiteness conjectures and all that stuff came up from this exploration. So, <clears throat> so the, the I'm, I'm going to bore you a little bit just because I want to show you that this is so explicit, right? So the first data set they were thinking about is, you know, you can look at this collaboration that took four years to try to generalize this quintic. That's just true. No, this is the beginning of data mining in, like, theoretical physics. I mean, it's, it's just kind of crazy. Before this, you know, this is not the kind of research that physicists did, right? Because, you know, we did funding diagrams, computer things, it never occurred to us to start cataloging other different varieties. But because of this paper, physicists started cataloging these things. So, well, let's try to generalize. One way to generalize is, well, instead of having a single projected space as, a, as your ambient you know, embedding space, let's have a, have a product of it. So the way to read this is CPN1 cross CPN2 cross W cross CPN N. And because each CP is Kähler, the direct product is also Kähler. And so any sub variety of that is still Kähler, so it's Kählerness is guaranteed. And to generalize this Clavier condition, each row sum 
must be one more than each of them. And the number of columns should be the sum of the first column minus three. So that will complete the intersection conditions. And we'll try to, you can, you know, this is just one way to do it. We can completely generalize this. But let's just start baby steps. Even classifying this problem already required the supercomputer at the time. This is very important. You just like, now these days, you know, when I'm whatever, just run on some laptop, right? Or okay, take a cluster at the uni, just, just do it. But this is 1986 ish, right? And these guys had like punch cards, like plastic feeding punch cards. And the CERN, and they were talking about what's the best computer we had access to, just things. They very quickly realized you can't do this by hand anymore. And I don't want to emphasize, this is really important. Like, just write them simple matrices like this. So the quintic one, of course, would be, you know, I've already written this. The quintic one would be a single one by one matrix, that's this one. Right? And the five cyclic ones would be like a, a one by whatever matrix. But what prevents you from thinking, you know, maybe there's like a, a seven by 12 possibility. So they, they were at least able to bound this. And they said, well, all this matrix sizes should be something between, like, I don't know, two. You can just by combining first, you can show that this is bounded by 20 by 20 very quickly. But classifying integer 20 by 20 matrices is you don't want to do this by hand. And they quickly realized you can't even do this by your best, you know, Apple generation two, um, you know, little box. And they really had to go to the best computer at the time. But they were really resourceful. So these guys went and said, hmm, the best computer right now we have access to is the CERN supercomputer. And so they, they actually went to CERN and like not told them what they were doing. And they said, oh yeah, we're doing particle physics. Well, I guess the sum of the book is particle physics. And they just fed in like plastic punch cards. And then so, and they start, they, they classified all these configurations. And there's a printout of this, there's a historical printout of this. There are two versions of this data left. Um, one is magnetic tape. You guys don't even know what it is, right? You know, it's like this spindle magnetic tapes. It's somewhere in Andy Lufkin's office in Norway. You, you need to go to a museum to be able to read it. And the other one is a stack of printouts of 7,890 matrices in Philip's office with like dot matrix printer. You know, do you even know what that is? But back, you know, these days you get printed the tape that comes out. Back in the day, the it's scroll. There's like little punch thing, and then you and then you have these long pages. There, you know, there are dots in it. So you can rip one page off at a time, and then it scrolls by feeding this printer. So he's so Philip printed the whole thing out at CERN, and there's seven thousand eight hundred of these matrices, one per page, like this, and then and you take this and you compare this part, this part. It's not that bad. And I carry it in the suitcase. I mean, it's, a, it's like historic artifact. So the number, the total numbers of this, to kind of show story. So you can show there are 7,090 of these. Um, they're one by one. So the only one by one is the quintic. And it goes up to 12 by 15. Something. And it has 266 six distinct hot numbers. And 70 distinct order numbers. They all happen to be negative, which is kind of interesting. I mean, there's no reason, but, you know, this is, uh, you know, careful with da big data. You know, by, by 1980s, this is really big data, right? 8,000 inches is really big data. Um, it just, they all happen to be negative, but, <coughs> but you know, you know this is biased. That's how have this data set is biased. And, um, but it is what it is. Well, uh, obviously, we, we, we're doing better now. We, we've actually taken this matrix, we've regenerated these matrices. Now they're freely available online. It's about two megabytes, like nothing. Fits into a pen. But back in the day, this was impressive data. Um, <clears throat> but it is kind of really remarkable. Right? You know, the physicists sat down and tried to answer a problem in under relativity. This is probably the first time that a supercomputer was used in my life ever for this purpose. I think it's, I, I still find this remarkable. It's 86, right? This is before any of you were born. But this is, well, no, I was saying, this is before I was born. No, no, I sadly <laughs> thought. I, I was, no, I was, I was a little kid. I was hoping, but unfortunately, you know. Um, 
Um, so if you just do this matrix, you know, these are matrices, right, which are called QIJ. And each input, input between 0 and 5, um, C1 is 0, of course. C2 is a combinatorial formula. And the C3, which is it's actually the only number, you can also write it explicitly in terms of matrices. So that's the, the, the chart classes of phi. <coughs> the index theorem says that the difference of H11 and H21 is just this, this um, integral. But remember I said, how do you, you know, you make a grown man try because you can't get this number just by reading all this. But each individual term H11 and H21 is very difficult to get. How to get it? Just to give you a taster, <coughs> You've got to chase sequences and, until you're blue in the face. Right. There, there's an there's a explicit method to set up an exact sequence and induce non-exact sequence in homology. You have to chase it. So, I mean, this is computerized. A lot of this is computerized. But even if you want to check, so on the Quintic now, if you just type in stage, I just say like H1, this variety, hit return, it will very quickly say 1. And H21, it has returned 101. This is very good, right? You like this. However, even if you want to try on like the two, the, the four quadratics in CP7, you hit return, you wait maybe a couple of hours, it will spit out 23. But it's because it's, I mean, it's done. And then for the higher ones, it's already beyond, you know, this, you know, this 12 by 17 ones, it's impossible. Which is kind of interesting. We're breaking the limit of our computation, even with the database that goes back to 40 years ago. Which is, there's no computer program which compute, you know, a generic computer. We can specialize it, but a generic computer program can no longer address this problem. Just not because we don't know how to, we know exactly what to do. I mean, just chase these sequences, set up every bound in the, every one of these is a very large n by n matrix. Find the null space of that matrix, subtract it by the image of the previous one, and we know exactly what to do. But it's so hard because this matrix is so damn big and you just can't do it. So it breaks current technology. But at least for these ones, um, you can do, uh, not on a generic computer program, but specialized just for this data set. You can do it. And it's done in this wonderful book. See, I don't just advertise my own books. This is a fantastic book that I think no graduate student of your generation even has ever heard of, right? When I was a graduate student, this was the Bible to learn algebra geometry. Because this is this was this was actually the this was actually the first textbook in algebraic geometry for physicists ever written because of uh Hoosh was on this collaboration right here. This is a Hoosh of the book here. I think he was Canellis's postdoc at the time. So he really got to know how to compute these suckers. And then he wrote this book about it. The first half of this book is to just introduce the physicist was an algebraic variety. And the second half of the book is how to compute this sucker. And they did it. I mean, they did it over like a, you know, a period of five to ten years. And they actually finally got the individual term, H11 and H21. That's, not, that's what they need to do. Everything else is, you know, you can do by index theorem or by combinatorial. But just getting individual H11 and H21 was so difficult, it took them two years and more, five years more after the classification to just get 7,890 pairs of integers. And it's already, it's all there. It's kind of nice. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful, underappreciated classic story. One day, history shall be written about how these guys were doing it. And there's no biography of this. Somebody should write the biography of this story. I think Philip should just like write the story. Because this is the first time that I've read geometry has touched physics. Before this, differential geometry because of Einstein, but algebra geometry in terms of physics, I mean, and then the rest is now taken over, but you really start doing this. <coughs> you want to look at distributions? So H11 is pretty Gaussian, and H21 is pretty flat. And this is a generic feature, I have no theorem to prove this, but generically, if you plot H11 of final of kind of varieties, it's pretty much k, right? It kind of always looks Gaussian. If you from H21, I mean, this is just for this data set, but for all, all the other data sets that I'm aware of, it's kind of flat. Why? I have no idea. There must be some theorem with this, but I don't know. And the distribution of the order numbers are, you know, I guess, skewed to the negative half. 
You want to finish just the next? Okay, for well, just one more data set. Then I want to move. Just one more data set. Just, just for for him. Um, so I said this is a this is a skewed data set because the order numbers are all negative. There's no reason to be. They're just literally classified in the computer all negative. You just do this integral. They all tend to, the order number. Remember, you can always do by integral. It's it doing this distribution. This took that. This took immediate. This was immediate. Like you know, this one evening of computer work. After the use the super is classified, the order numbers is completely immediately computed. The individual H1 and H2 one took five years. But even on computers, because you don't even know where to go with this, right? You don't, you're going to do all of this stuff. I hope she explains how to do this stuff. So, <clears throat> interestingly, at this time, Philip, because he's such a such a smart guy, he knows this can't be possible because he knew about mirror symmetry. So what's mirror symmetry? Mirror symmetry switches H21 with H11. Right, that's what mirror symmetry is. So, so I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead myself. So remember this, this diamond, the Hodge diamond. You know, you've got functional dualities and, and complex simulation, which gives structure to this. But then there's this really crazy one, which says to reflect not along any of these principal diagonals, but reflect upon this line. Why the hell would you ever do that? Right? So this this flip was unknown to mathematics because mathematicians would say this is too crazy. If you think about the exception which you're doing, right? You're, this is a two cycle. This is a three cycle. You're missing even an odd cycle. Right? In, if you think about that in terms of number theory. You're flipping the numerator and the denominator of the zeta function. Why would you ever do something like that? Right? And in terms of geometry, you're switching an even cycle with an odd cycle. Right? So in other words, you're exchanging so a three cycle inside a three complex cycle, that's symplectic geometry. So this flip exchanges Kähler geometry with symplectic geometry, which no mathematician, self-respecting mathematician would ever do. Because it's just unthinkable. But it turned out that for because Philip is so insightful, um, he says just, just just do it. I mean, of course, he, this was motivated by a lot of background, you know, with the numerator geometry and all that stuff and component field theory, and I'm completely skipping because I don't need it. But physicists knew to do this flip, which at the time was unheard of in mathematics, both in terms of symplectic, well, in terms of symplectic Kähler geometry and in terms of number theory. You'll never do something like but Philip says, well, well, we should do this because there is mirror symmetry. But so what is mirror symmetry for all the number? Well, because all the number is the difference, mirror symmetry should flip Euler to minus Euler. In other words, for every chi, for a manifold that is chi of something, there should be a mirror manifold whose chi is the positive of that. And in this entire data set, which is the first data set you would have, there is none. What's, what's over here? So the sissy data set was very fast. So Philip says, well, let's think a bit harder. Surely I can generalize the quintic again. So instead of generalizing the quintic by having a single projective ambient space into a product of projective spaces, Philip says, well, the other way to do it is to generalize a projective space by weighted projective. By putting weights. I mean, why not? Let's just try it. You know, well, like, really, this really was a trial and error. And how much can you construct here? So now you have a five vector of weights. So the quintic you can see before is the trivial weight, so where all the weights are one, 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 right? That's what projective space means. It's everything is identified with lambda times that space. But weighted projective space is you just put in weights and say it's identification. It's sad that Ed's not here. Because Ed's favorite data set is actually this one. 
I should wait until next week when Ed comes here. Um, and now they classified five vectors, integer vectors, co-prime integer vectors, which have this property, and they came up with 7,555 more. So suddenly the, the space of clavier threefolds went from one to five to 7,890 to 7,890 plus 7,555. So it's kind of, which is still, I mean, it's finite, right? It's, but it was a bit surprising to them that suddenly it was even surprising to Yao that, you know, Yao said, well, maybe there are five, six of them. And suddenly the physicists look 16,000 on the table. Right? Totally crazy, right? Because no one would, it's like, holy crap, no one position would ever kind of do something like this. Like, they were so impressed, by the way. Like, Yao and all these growths and all these mathematicians, like, holy crap, right? This is a very strange way to do algebraic geometry. Because of Bubarki, right? Because, you know, algebraic geometry after the 1950s, 60s was about, let's consider a derived functor over this, you know, j j this is JK land. And then, if you want to actually have an example, they're like, um, I, maybe there's one. And suddenly, this is 16,000 right here. I mean, literally, like, I can imagine this is 7,990 like this. And then the mathematician when they were kind of stunned, like, what do I even do with this data? So it's kind of funny. So suddenly the number of possible Hodge pairs came to around about 3,000, so and, and so each point is here. And the order number is now between 960 to plus 960. So this is this is a much more balanced form of stuff. So this is the first experimental evidence for mirror symmetry. Because every point here, there's a mirror point here. This is one that switches eight points. So th at, at this point, the positions really started to be in the mirror symmetry. Let's just look at it. I mean, if they, if they saw this, they wouldn't have been in the symmetry. But then they saw this. Here's, here are almost 8,000 points which are mirrored to each other. For every one of these manifolds, there is explicitly another one, which is H11, H21, fit. Um, interestingly, <coughs> um, this 960 is very cute. Uh, so, of course, you know, there's this single point here, that's 960, and then this point minus, minus 960. Um, no known caveat threefold has ever been constructed in the last 50 years to exceed the order number. There's no theorem that says 960 is the largest one. Um, it's certainly consistent with Yao's conjecture, there's a finite number of these, but no matter how you do it, no one has ever come up with a compact, smooth clavier threefold whose order number has ever exceeded 960. And this came out from this, you know, this scan of this data set. It wasn't even in the SISI data set, but somehow this weighted the vector point. Like these pair of points are really, really special. And you can see how the shapes in this. Oh, my God, I didn't know why it's true. You know, this is like data mining. So I conclude with this wonderful thing. I'm just doing this every single talk because I just I love this so much. Why is Amichai not here? He would really appreciate this. I think I might have shown Amichai this. But this is really like, you know, this is the beginning of data science in pure math. And it's done by physicists, so that's kind of really interesting. But um, this number is really mysterious. It's never been broken. I bet somebody a very a very expensive bottle of port that this will never be broken. But we never put on the conditions like you know in the next 20 years, 50 years. Uh, I think this this is breaking. So when um, yeah, so next next week I can tell you more stuff. <laughs>